Income tax 2022-2023, itemized deductions, interest you paid, tax software example. Let's do some wealth preservation with some tax preparation. Support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course. Each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it. Here we are in our example form 1040 populated with Lacert tax software. You don't need tax software to follow along, but it's a great tool to run scenarios with. You can also get access to the form 1040 related forms and schedules at the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov, starting point as usual, single filer, Mr. Anderson, 100,000 W-2 income, the 12,950 for the standard deduction gets to the taxable income. 87,050. We're mirroring that on our Excel worksheet. 100,000, 12,950, 87,050. Page two, doing the calculations. On page number two, we've got the tax at the 14,774. The 15,000 withheld gets us to the 226 on the bottom line, mirroring that on our equation here. Now, we're going to focus basically on the calculation of the taxable income and really focus in on the itemized deductions and the particular deduction of the mortgage interest. So let's go back on over and just kind of consider the itemized versus the standard deductions, which are down here. We would only be itemizing if they are greater than the standard deduction, which are a pretty large threshold for most normal people to, to clear which is 12,950 for single filers, double to 25,900 for married filers. Now the one, the big thing that kicks people over oftentimes is the ownership of a home because that usually comes along with a loan, a mortgage, and the interest on the mortgage is usually the big one that often adds a lot to the itemized deductions as well as the property taxes on the home. So you often, if, if there's two things you wanna kind of consider, the one is just the tax preparation. How do you do the data input from the form 1098 that you're gonna be getting if someone owns a home and uh, make sure that you populate in the tax return properly. And the other is when people ask questions about whether or not they should rent or purchase a home because now the IRS has kind of, kind of gotten into the decision-making process, which always confuses things and manipulates the markets to kind of work around the incentives that the tax code is having. People ask, well, the government is basically telling me they want me to buy a home and not rent because they're, they're giving me this big deduction. And to some extent, that's kind of true. But uh, oftentimes, the people that you end up talking to have an incentive in you purchasing a home. In other words, if you talk to someone like the bank that wants to give you a loan or a mortgage broker or a, a, a real estate broker and stuff, obviously they have some incentive to kind of over incentivize. Not that they all do or they're, they're not being honest, but you typically want to be talking to someone who's neutral when you're thinking about these big decision making processes and possibly pay them for just their opinion. And when it comes to the taxes, you can't just say, well, you're going to get this big deduction of interest and uh, the property taxes because it really depends on on how close you are to the to taking the standard deduction in terms of how much of benefit you're going to get. In other words, if if you had to pay, you know, ten thousand dollars of mortgage interest, first of all, it's still payment. It's still rent that you're paying. You're basically just the money's going away. It's not paying down the principal. You're paying you know rent on the loan, but you might be able to get a deduction for that. However. If, if you're not, if you're nowhere close to this 12,950, the actual benefit you're going to get from that $10,000 deduction is less than $10,000, right? Because, because you could have got the standard deduction anyways. So it gets quite messy. To, you messy beast. To try to determine what the actual benefit is, even though you get the full deduction 
of the property tax and the interest. And the only way to really get an accurate calculation of that is to do tax projections. So that's the best way I, I would think uh, to do that. So that's something to just kind of keep in mind when that question uh, comes up. And so let's look at an example, for example. Let's say, so this person, 12,950, we've got nothing at this point in time in terms of the itemized deductions. Therefore, the itemized deductions are nowhere near high enough. All we have are, are, are state taxes, which in like California could be quite high. The state taxes could be pushing you pretty close to the limit already. Uh, and, and so for high cost of living areas, you could be you could be close, right? Because I might be with I might happen to be paying like ten thousand dollars in state taxes already. And it wouldn't take much for me to clear the threshold uh, after that point. But let's let's say we're at this point right now. So I'm not taking the state taxes. These are just the these are just the uh, sales tax calculation tables. And then I'm going to go to the to the tab over here. And let's say we had in the deductions for the schedule a the big one we're looking at here which is the interest now recording the interest is usually pretty straightforward you'll get a 1098 once everything has been uh set up and then we'll have uh, the mortgage interest and sometimes the company that that is paying or processing the mortgage interest will also be taking care of the property taxes and they'll give you the property taxes paid as well but you can't depend on that because the property taxes could be bundled with your mortgage payment, but don't have to be, you might be paying the property taxes separate. So if you don't see the property taxes with the, the information that comes with the 1098, for example, that doesn't mean that there's no property taxes. Obviously there's property taxes almost everywhere. So you're going to have to get the property taxes uh, some other way. <clears throat> Those two things should go together. All right. So we're going to say that the mortgage interest and points. So I'll put that up here and let's, let's say it was 10,000. And so we're going to say 10,000, that's the interest. So you're already paying, you know, you're not paying down the principal. This is just the interest. Also realize that the interest for year one is the highest amount of interest. The interest is going to be going down from year to year. So when you think about your tax benefit, the highest benefit you're going to get is when you're paying the highest interest at the beginning of the loan. At the end of the loan, if it's a 30 year loan, it's 30 years from now. But at the end of the loan, your interest is going to be very low even though your mortgage payments are the same because that's that's the way the 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 amortization table works we try to fix the payments that you're making and in order to do that we have to have a deviation or a difference between the the dollar amount going to the the interest versus the principal portion of the reduction so so that means that's another thing that just kind of keep in mind you might say well there's a huge tax benefit in year one but you also got to realize that as time passes, that tax benefit's going to go down, even though the mortgage paid off mortgage uh, is going to stay the same in terms of dollar amount, generally, depending on the type of mortgage you have. But usually it'll be the same if it's a 30 year fixed or 15 year fixed or something like that. And then if you have interest, you would assume that there's going to be property taxes. So let's go to the property taxes and uh, and we're going to say that's in my taxes area. And let's say that they are at. 2000, let's say 2000. So if I do that and I go back on over, note that this individual is just barely clearing at the 1317. Uh, so if I go back to the form 1040, now we're at 1317. So, so if you were to talk to someone that's trying to over emphasize the set, like if you're talking to someone that wants to wants you to buy a home or something because, because they want to make their commission on it or whatever they're gonna they're gonna emphasize and say look at this dude you got a ten thousand deduction plus a two thousand uh, dollar deduction for the property taxes i mean and you know you're in a home and this and that but really uh if i if and 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 by doing that by doing that also you 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 were able to open up your other your other kind of deductions such such as the more the interest 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 right here but if I go back on over to the form 1040 and I say, well, yeah, but before I was, I, I had 12,950. And so, so really that barely, that barely pushed me over, right? Because now I'm taking 13,017 minus the 12,950. I only, hold on a second, 13,017 minus the 12,950. 
I only got a benefit of like $67 over, over what I was doing before. Right. So it's, so it's not, it's not as cut and dry. So if I look at my actual tax consequences of this and I go, okay, well, here's my schedule, my schedule a, and we're going to say that the taxes, the real estate taxes we said was 2000 and the mortgage interest we said was 10,000. And that's going to add up <clears throat> to 12,000. If I pull that to the first page, then I've got, I'm still under, I've got to add the tax as well. So let's add the tax. And so this is, this is the tax being calculated for the state tax, which is I'm letting the system do it. This is the sales tax that I'm, I'm using here at 1017. So we're going to say, okay, 1017, one seven, and that brings it up to 13, uh, 17. So now the 1317 is greater than the 12,950, but barely, right? And so it's $67 difference. So now I'm at 86, 86, 983. So if I go back on over here and say, does that match up here? 86, 983, that looks good. And then page two, the tax is at 14, 552. Let's put the old tax here, 14774. 14,952. So the difference in the tax is a whopping uh, 178. 178. That still seems high to me. Is that right? 14,752. 14,752. That's why it should be 14,752. So $22 difference, right? That looks right. So, so then in the 15,000 and the 248. So, so you can see again, it's not always it may not be the perfect, you know, always be the greatest thing. Now, some people like if you're in a situation, let's reverse that and say, okay, let's take it out for now. And let's say that you're paying, you live in California <laughs> and you're paying state taxes of $10,000 already, you know, so, you know, but okay. So if that's the case and I go back on over here, I could say, okay, now, I, I, if I don't have the mortgage interest, then then I'm on the 1040 page one. So so now I'm, I'm have the 12,950, but I'm paying all the state tax. So if I go down to the schedule A, and it's being capped at the 10,000, but you know, and if I made more than that, it might be capped. So if I put if I put the state tax up to as we saw before 15,000, then it's now being capped right <laughs> at the 10,000 but the 10,000 is a lot closer to that 12,000 you know number that we needed so so now if i added the mortgage interest you you might have more of us it might be you know closer you're going to get a bigger benefit so if i go back on over and say okay now let's add my mortgage interest i'm going to say the interest and home mortgage and what did i say it was 10,000 here i think and then the taxes, I'm going to say, were the principal residence of 2000, I think is what we said. And then let's do that. And so now if I go back on over, now that allows me to, to open up also the, the 10,000 that was close. I was right close to being able to itemize anyways, just on the state taxes, right? So now I've been able to open up that added 10, you know, that added 10,000. So now if I pull that on over to here and I say my schedule A is to do that. And then this is at 10,000 and this comes up to 22, 22. Uh, so hold on a second. It should be, I'm at 22. K paso. So let's say I've got the 10,000 for the state taxes. Oh, taxes are limited. This one's going to be limited. I should use an if formula here because now I'm also being limited by the state taxes for the property taxes because my, so let me do an if formulas equals if. So this is a logic function to cap it at 10,000. So let's try it out. So equals if brackets, the sum brackets of these two, if adding those up, closing up the brackets is greater than uh, 10, thousand then with a comma i want you to cap it at ten thousand 
But if not, meaning it's less than 10,000, I want you to take the sum of these two and that should cap it at 10,000. So the bracket at the end, so there it is. So that if it was less than 10,000, cause this was like 1,000, then it would do that. And then it's gonna cap it at the 10,000. Okay, so there's that. And so that brings us down to the uh, total itemized at the 20 and here it's saying it's 20,000. And if I go to page one, then we've got the 100,000 minus the 20,000 gets us to the 80,000 as we have here. So it's taking the greater of the two, which brings us to the 80,000. And notice now we have a much more substantial difference that we had before because we were pretty close, even though on the high income side, you can see that it gets it gets capped on that state taxes, which is one of the big uh, kind of components as well. So it's not it's not a clean picture is what I'm trying to say here. And so then if I say that the tax on page two is uh, 13223. So now it's going to be 13223. So now we had a, a savings, I believe if that's still correct of the 1551, which which is a better, you know, uh, scenario, but it's still kind of a confusing scenario because again, we had to pay 10,000 in the interest in order to get the tax savings and we lost the property tax uh, benefit because our state income tax was high enough that it hit the cap of 10,000. So you can see how it all, everything gets kind of messy. It's not a clear cut picture uh, with the deductions and to really understand them, you have to basically run a run a projection and see what the actual cash flows are. And you would have to do it not only for the current year, <clears throat> but also going into the future as your interest. I have taken out a very high interest loan. Uh, amount deduction decreases over time, which doesn't happen significantly from one year to the next if it's a 30 year loan, but it is significant over the span of the 30 years. Okay, so that said, uh, we've got the data input for the interest. Now you could have a situation where we have, for example, uh, if I look at the interest here, we've got the home mortgage interest and points. If you, if you don't use all of your home mortgage loans or buy or build your home, see instructions. So remember, we've got those caps and limitations on, on the mortgage interest. If we use the, if we use the loan for the home, and if we uh, have a caps in terms of the loan limitations to see the deductibility of them. So we saw that in a prior presentation. And so you might have a situation where you have the 1098, but you have to, you have to limit that for one reason or another due to those caps. So just be aware of that. We've got the home mortgage interest and points uh, reported to you form 1098. So notice here that that 1098 will be provided to the IRS. So the IRS would expect this number to be the same or less than the amount on the 1098. You can imagine if it's less than the amount on the 1098, the government shouldn't have a big issue with that because now you're taking less of a deduction than the form that they have says you might be able to take, to, even though there might be reasons why it would be smaller than that. And if it's greater than the amount that's on the 1098, you can imagine the IRS would be skeptical of that and possibly want some rationale as to why that would be because the form they have looks like it should be at whatever it should be and not greater than that, right? And then B here says the home mortgage interest not reported to you on form 1098. So now this is where the interest goes if it's not on the form 1098. And we ran and looked at multiple scenarios in like our, our uh, prior presentation. So, so you, you might have someone else got the 1098 for some reason, or it's possibly you have a seller financed mortgage, for example. So now you don't have a financial institution that has the loan, but basically an individual. And in that case, you might have to report it on 8B because you didn't get a 1098, which means that again, the IRS is going to be skeptical about the deductibility of it. So if I bring this, for example, down here, and I say that this is uh, the home mortgage interest not on the form 1098. So now they want the payee's name. So I'm going to say Sam and social security number, dot, 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 payer or EI or EIN number, the address and the zip and so on. And then the amount. So if I, I won't populate all of that, but if I pull that on over, you can see what's happening here. The IRS is going, Hey, look, if you're getting a benefit from the deduction, 
I want to know who should have issued you the 1098 because they're going to look at the other side of the transaction, just like any normal thing when you get a 1099 or a W-2. They're going to look at the other side of the transaction and see if that person included the income on their side of things, right? And then you've got the points uh, not reported to you on the form 1098. So they're getting better and better. These points is another just messy kind of factor because one, the points, sometimes when you look, when you talk to mortgage brokers and stuff, they talk about points that don't relate to interest any at all, which means they're not really deductible. So they use points, that terminology to, to refer to things other than interest, which isn't, and then, and then when it does refer to interest, sometimes that interest is going to be like they're trying to prepay the interest is the, is the idea. And then the question is, well, if it's a prepayment of the interest, do I get to, do I get to deduct it at all if there are points? And if I do, do I, do I get to deduct all of the interest points at the, at the beginning when I paid them, which is like a kind of a prepayment, which IRS usually doesn't like to do that. Or do I have to put them on the books and amortize the points over uh, the life of the loan? right those are the things that have to be set up now usually this is a complexity that only really comes up when the first purchase of the home takes place and you might have to look at the closing documents and whatnot and determine what qualifies as points and then determine whether or not you could take the points at that point in time or whether or not you have to amortize the points over the uh, uh, over the future period and once that has been set up then the amortization if applicable will will be done automatically and it'd be pretty easy going forward they're getting better at reporting points and kind of standardizing what they mean and the deductibility of them on the form 1098 but it's still kind of a a messy type of situation so if you had to put the points on the books and amortize them it might look something like this usually the data input in the software would be the similar place that you would put like depreciation type of information for like a schedule C or something. And then I'm gonna say that they're points and you might wanna to refer to the actual loan that the points are in. And then I gotta determine that th this is gonna to go to not a schedule C or anything, but to uh, to the points. And then we're gonna say that the 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 date I'm gonna put is here, 1-1-22 uh, in this case, I'm gonna say that the cost was 500. And then I'm just gonna do a straight line uh, amortization of the points applying them over like the life and that's one you know method that can be that's kind of like the easy way to deal to do with it if you're allowed to do a straight line kind of method and then it's going to be 30 years assuming it's a 30-year loan just because our loan is 30 and so i'm going to say okay boom and then if i pull that over to the schedule a then you'll have uh the points pulling over in here so now the points are being calculated so that's something that oftentimes, again, is confusing when a home is first purchased and you might have to go through the closing documents and determine how the points need to be calculated and then put it on the books with your amortization schedule and so on. Going forward after that time, the data input should be quite easy because in future periods, if you've got this amortization populated properly and you're using the same software, it should populate itself You know, going forward uh, from that point in time and now you've got your depreciation schedules here which I just did a straight line points depreciation uh, 17 and then if I looked at the the next year 2023 what's going to happen same same thing right it's going to be depreciating another 17 until the whole $500 of the points has been removed or allocated which is going to be fully allocated over 30 years because it's just been evenly allocated over 30 years so that gets a little bit messy on the points situation okay and then if i go back on over to the schedule a and we look at the interest the other the other is investment so uh and then you would attach this uh, form 40 4952 so let's look at the good old form 4952 4952 49 where are my glasses 4952 okay so now you've got your investment interest. Now, remember when we talk about interest, the, it's the natural thing to deduct are the things for an income tax system that helped you to generate revenue. So, so notice that the mortgage interest on the home is funny because that, that's, that's not in alignment with the normal rule. You can argue why they would do that. And I'm not trying to say they should or shouldn't do it or anything, but I'm just saying it's not like a, the normal kind of thing because the home is a personal property 
and it's not like you needed the home to help you to generate revenue. And if you had the interest for a Schedule C business in order to buy property planting equipment so that you can help use it to generate revenue, that would be a normal and natural kind of deduction for an income tax type of system. The argument for the mortgage interest, of course, is that everybody should have a home, so we're gonna incentivize the home purchase. My personal opinion is in the long term of that happening, all that happens is you just distorted the economy so that the market takes into consideration all these complex tax consequences. And at the end of the day, once all that settles out, it, it's no one's really benefiting. Everybody's just adjusted their all their positions around this complexity and all the prices have changed to reflect the new reality of the tax laws. So to me, it just adds complication in the long run, in the short run. But, you know, it is what it is. But if you look at the in, if you look at the investment interest, it's the same kind of thing. You would think if you had some kind of property that wasn't real estate property, if it was, if, I mean, it wasn't like your your personal residence, but maybe it's a, a piece of real estate or, or property or something like that, then you might be holding on to it for, as investment or other types of investments that you financed for that investment property. Then, then that would be another situation where you would think that the interest might be deductible because, you, because you're using it to generate income in that case. But uh, it's a little bit messy in this case in terms of the incentives for the government because it seems a little bit kind of weird for, to, to be incentivizing that leveraged for people to have like this leveraged position where they have where they're taking out debt for the investments. But in any case, if you have the investment interest, and usually more well-off individuals would have investment interests and possibly not so much on the lower income side then we could pull it in here 4950 that would pull into the schedule a and so it pulls in to uh the schedule a down here so investment interest and i'm sorry it's limited to the investment income so i'd have to go through and and, and basically have the investment income in order to calculate the limitations on the investment interest. So if I add say quali uh, qualified dividends, let's go back on over and say, let's say we had uh, income from passive income. I'm gonna say interest income and dividend income. So let's say that this was miscellaneous dividend income, uh, it, let's say it was 6,000, 6,000, and pull that back on over. So now we've got the dividend income and the investment income being pulled over to the Schedule A. So there's, there it is. So that's just a, gen, a general kind of calculate of the investment income. Again, it's probably something that's gonna be coming up more often on more well-off individuals you would think. So that's just a general idea of how this kind of put, is put together. Remember that that uh, credit card interest typically isn't deductible. If you have a, a, a Schedule C type of business, then, and, and you have the business use of your home, then you might have to allocate some of your your uh, interest to, to the business use of the home and some of it to the Schedule A, right? So, you, so then you can't double dip so you've got to be careful in that kind of situation. You might have to do the same thing with the property taxes, which runs into another kind of messy situation because now we have this cap on the state taxes and so on. And so what happens when you you know pull over part of the taxes and try to deduct it on the Schedule C when you would have been capped at the 10,000 over here if the cap wasn't applied and so on. And so we have that that you've got to be careful of and uh, again, just in terms of the general rules, uh, you need to be careful in terms of what the actual benefits will be of purchasing a home and actually map it out, uh, map it out, map out the cash flows as best you can with an actual with an actual projection. <laughs> and note that those projections will change in the future and take into consideration the tax code could change substantially in the future as it did, you know, a couple of years ago when it increased the the uh, standard deductions.